please welcome founder and chairman of Rocket Companies and co-founder of the Gilbert Family Foundation, Dan Gilbert, and chairman and chief executive officer of 1642 Ventures, Dennis Archer Jr. Man, I gotta say, I'm really uh, impressed at all these people that fill the room to come see me, and thank you for being here too. Well, look at your sneakers. Yeah, these are good. These are, I got these from, these are StockX, Air Jordan 1 KOs, Canvas. Were you, those are 11s? These are the Jordan 11 cool grays. You gotta step up your game. Man. I got clearly, <laughs> clear. Hey, I, I wanna thank um, uh, Suzanne Shank for having us both up here. She's a good friend and she's done a great job. We can give her another round of applause. And Suzanne, she actually sits on your board, right? When you went yeah. public, you had to obviously appoint a founding board and you selected Suzanne. Yeah. Suzanne, like, is the board. Yeah, she does an outstanding yeah. job. Yeah. Hey, look, I I've heard a couple people say, and you commented um, about you being five years late to this party, yeah. and time flies, so I'm not sure how many of you um, have kept track of that, but it was five years ago, Memorial Day weekend, that Dan had a stroke. Um, and he was supposed to come up here, and ironically, I got stuck with Bill Emerson instead, but I think that we, we carried, the, carried the water for you. You know, you have said to me on more than one occasion in regards to, to that health challenge that you would not wish that on your worst enemy. Um, if, you, if you look at how you've led your life up to the date of having your stroke, is there anything that you would have done differently? Yeah, I don't think that my stroke was actually from stress, anxiety, although I had plenty of it and still have plenty of it, but because at least that's what the doctor said. I had a dissection, this genetic thing in one of my arteries, so it wasn't like the stress, anxiety caused it. So I don't know what I would have done much different as far as lifestyle before the stroke. You certainly learn a lot after the stroke. And so your health today, you're moving around well, you're yeah. back in the office. Yeah, I'm back in the office two or three days a week. I can use my cane to get around a little bit. I just have a great physical therapy team around me, got good family around me, friends. It takes a village, I'll tell you what. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Let's talk about um, doing well while doing good. Um, when I got out of law school, I went to work for a firm called Graymark Realty Advisors. It was owned by two African-American entrepreneurs, Charles Allen and Hansel Minyard. And Charles, from day one, always talked about doing well while doing good. And in fact, Chuck Todd, when he was up here earlier with Devin Skillian, talked about benevolent billionaires. Um, Andrew Carnegie, Dan, as we all know, was a, a formidable American entrepreneur very early on, was um, founded the steel industry that ultimately built America. But in the gospel of wealth, and I wanna quote, he argued that extremely wealthy Americans like himself had a responsibility to spend their money in order to benefit the greater good. In other words, the richest Americans should actively engage in philanthropy and charity in order to close the widening gap between rich and poor. So going back to Charles and Hansel and doing well while doing good, let's start by the doing well. Um, since 2011, Bedrock has committed more than $7.5 billion to develop more than 140 buildings in Detroit and Cleveland. StockX, at its last raise, had a $3.9 billion valuation, first unicorn born in Detroit. Um, Quicken Loans went public, allowing thousands of your teammates to take advantage and participate in the risk and upside of the business. From a business standpoint, not philanthropy, we'll get to philanthropy, but from a business standpoint, what are you most proud of, and would you have done anything differently in business? Well, there's, there's a lot of things I would do different in business. I, I, I don't know where I'd start the list, but you, the first part was what am, what am I the proudest of? Yeah, what are you most proud of in business? Well, I just like building things. I like building companies, and, and to watch all of our people come together as a team and build what we're building, there's nothing more exciting than that. And then being able to deploy that wealth in the communities that we live in and, and watch it springboard from there, it all connects together. Everything's connected together, and I'm very, very excited about the future, not only on the philanthropy side, but the business side as well. So you've got to, you've got to have a great business, really, to actually impact the community, because you've got to have the wealth and the profits and the people. It's not just the, the wealth, it's the people that we have. We, you know, when you have almost 20,000 people and they're all united, and they're all 
getting behind a cause like Detroit. All of them are involved to some degree. That's a small army, 20,000 people. So, I mean, there's other businesses here who have big employee counts. I encourage them to not just put money and write checks, but to get their people behind it, because once you get the people behind it, then things really start to happen. You know, so that's the doing well. Now, doing good. Uh, you and Jennifer made a $500 million philanthropic commitment to Detroit. Um, let's first talk about health care. $375 million to help bring the rehabilitation and research facilities to Henry Ford's expansion. Um, recently, I think all of you who looked at Cranes this week, there's a $21 million commitment uh, to help 18 research grants uh, related to neurofibromatosis, which is uh, the disease that we lost Nick to. Um, and to date, you've invested over $125 million to fund that cure. I've had a chance to meet with Jerry Darby and Bob Riney. I don't know if they're in the audience, uh, with regards to their $2 billion campus expansion um, with Henry Ford. So a lot of investment in healthcare. Talk about the importance of investing in healthcare and can that be an uh, economic development tool to help grow the city of Detroit? Well, first of all, for me personally, when I had this happen to me five years ago, and I was supposed to be here, as you mentioned, so yeah. sorry I'm five years late, but at least we're here. Better, better late than never. Yeah, exactly. But the, the uh, repeat your question again. The, right? the investment. The, talk about the importance of investing, particularly in research institutions, medical research, well, trying to, take to a, a city. Trying to take a tragic situation and learn from it and being able to have some good come out of it was the thing I was focused on from the first few months that this happened to me. And then, of course, our son, my wife and myself felt the same way. How could we have good things happen out of it? And being in a fortunate position to be able to donate or contribute that money with the great things that Henry Ford is doing. And then Michigan State is involved in it, as you know. So we've got Michigan State, Henry Ford, we've got us, we've got some others that are involved in the peripheral, but to have all that come together and see some good things come out of tragic life situations at least gives it some solace. I'm glad that we've got some Michigan State representation on stage because there was a lot of Go Blue mentioned earlier, so What's you're representing. It? We'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I've got a bunch of questions. I, you know, came up yesterday morning with six or seven people. We flew up, and so... I've got a whole, it's like a Jimmy Fallon thing, questions from the plane. And right. one of the questions uh, from the plane, I think it was from Ramsey, um, talked about whether developing a medical campus can serve as an economic development boost for the city. Will you then have spinoff businesses, restaurants, other perhaps entities that provide service to the hospital? Because I, you know, I know that I see the mayor and his bride are sitting in the front row. And I think that they would love to hear that uh, not only will there be investment in these medical facilities, but that it will spawn growth around the campuses. I, mean, I don't think there's any question about it. When you make that kind of investment that Henry Ford's making, I mean, you've got a huge new building coming in, and, or buildings, and you've got thousands of people that work on this campus. And like you said, they're all going to need to eat, maybe a lot of them in your restaurant, by the way. If you, keep, if you keep things going all right. All right, well. You know, <laughs> you know you've, got a, you've got a lot more competition now, you know. There's a lot more competition. Which is good news, I It's think. good news. Yep. It could, you know, a rising tide. Yep. Rising tide raises all ships, so they say. Yep. So, look, I, you know, there used to be a report that was uh, put out for several years, uh, the 7.2 square mile report, which talked about all the development that happened in the city in the 7.2 square miles thought of as the greater downtown Detroit area. Obviously downtown, but the villages and up to Midtown and down through Corktown, and maybe it included a little of Southwest Detroit. But those of us, Dan, that are Detroiters know that the heart and soul of the city is in the neighborhoods. Yeah. And that original investment that was centered in the 7.2 square miles is obviously now going throughout the neighborhoods. Um, lots of initiatives coming out of the mayor's office, supported by your organization, Gary Torgo and his philanthropy and others. You know, you guys uh, committed recently, the Family Foundation, $15 million to the Detroit Strategic Neighborhood Fund. David Blaskowitz, and I'm not sure if he's here or not, but he said that investments from organizations like the Gilbert Family Foundation 
have led to growth in neighborhoods, including more jobs, small businesses, improved streetscapes, and better recreational opportunities. Talk to us why it's so important to invest not just in downtown Detroit, but in the neighborhoods. Well, I think that you're never going to have a city do great if it's just the downtown doing great and the neighborhoods are not doing great as well. So maybe you look at a city and you build it from the inside out like we're doing, but the neighborhoods are coming along to their credit as well. And I think that when you have a city, a lot of the jobs in urban cores, or a lot of jobs in cities are in the urban cores. So if there are jobs downtown, then hopefully a lot of people in the neighborhoods are going to fill those jobs. That's a big part of it. But everything's connected to everything else, as I said earlier. Just like you invest, you were asking about the in private investment. I mean, just Henry Ford having that huge investment is just going to spawn off so many things. Not just attending your restaurants, other things is too. I mean, it's going to, <laughs> it's going to recruit high paid doctors and researchers to Henry Ford who will pay taxes to the mayor's office. And he'll do <laughs> and taxes, and he'll do good things with it. I mean, it just everything is connected to everything, any way you look at it. And I think that making big investments is very important. We have to, as Detroit, make big bets. I mean, what, what Ford Motor Company and Bill Ford is doing at the train station, that's a big bet. General Motors moving to the Hudson site and then revisioning the Renaissance Center, big bet. What we're doing at Hudson's is a big bet. I mean, we need some big bets, and we also need small bets as well, but big bets at least get the, they get things going and they get the capital moving to the city. And they're creating a lot of jobs. I think we just need to think big in Detroit and Michigan for that matter. So let's pivot off of, you know, the path that I was going down. We're going to come back to the importance of education. Mm -hmm. But since you brought up the Renaissance Center, yep. I figure let's touch on it. So the, the, the reports, um, no one, I, I don't think, necessarily understands the formality of the agreements, nor is it any of our business. But I think it's been very, it's very clear when you hear Mary Bear's comments that she speaks to coming up with a solution working with Bedrock. And so obviously, obviously you guys are going to play a role. And so if you could write the script as to what would happen with the Renaissance Center, uh, what would that script look like? I couldn't tell you the actual specific uses, but I will tell you that, that the mayor and the the city government as well as General Motors, ourselves, and um, the county, everybody's interested in making sure that that waterfront is, is redeveloped in a beautiful way, if it is redeveloped, but maybe part of it is, maybe part of it isn't. Maybe part of it is converted to some other use. But I think that everybody is interested in, in keeping some very exciting and promising development on that property, whatever comes up of it. I mean, we're, we are in a sort of a brainstorming mode right now. And that's, that's just very important. It's, it's, those have been landmarks for the city for decades now, and it's beautiful riverfront land and, and property. I think Mary said in the paper a couple days ago or a few weeks ago that how beautiful that property is and how the views, if you've ever been in her office, the views are really, really good. I don't know if they'll be as good as the Hudson views on top, so <laughs> you, you may, there's only 97 condos. You may want to get your deposit down on those. So. <laughs> That was Remember, a, that, AB, always be closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Right? By the way, that was a very political answer. You, didn't, yeah. you never really answered my question, but we're going we're gonna to move on. I said we're going to build a big, lot of good stuff. That oh, yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, you know, back to education. So in March, the Rocket Community Fund and the Regional Chamber uh, and the Last Mile Education Fund announced an expansion of the Detroit Al Area Talent Fund. You guys made a significant investment. Regarding education, it's interesting, in the city of Detroit, as you know, um, the mayor is not responsible um, for education. Dr. Vitti helms that organization. He's in here, up here somewhere, I saw him, so welcome, Dr. Vitti. From your opinion, what needs to change from a policy perspective um, for us to, to provide better education to our kids? And it's not just in the city of Detroit, but throughout the state of Michigan. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the intricacies of policy of education. I will say that, like everyone, I think, who looks at this, education is absolutely critical to society and to our kids and to our families and to everybody and to the businesses as well who need educated people to work at the businesses. So hopefully Dr. Vitti and his team will figure it out. It seems like they're on the right road from what I read and when I talk to people. Yeah, he's doing, he's doing an outstanding job. You know, regarding corporate responsibility, and uh, our friend Sandy Pierce was up here talking to us earlier, um, 
And when, when Detroit was recently in some of its most dire moments, a lot of people stepped up. Um, Sandy stepped up, you stepped up, Gary Torgo stepped up, Roger Penske stepped up. Um, you know, Vegas, we've talked about this, Vegas has had um, Tony Sy, Kevin Plank, who's a friend of yours, is kind of trying to mimic in Baltimore what we're doing here. And, you know, corporate philanthropy has evolved, I think, most recently when municipalities have had challenges to really step in and they did things like bought police cars and ambulances when we needed them because at the time the city couldn't afford them or was prohibited from making those investments at the time. So it gets a little blurred. H how, do you, how do you divide the responsibility or do you related to the corporate folks, philanthropy and, and municipal government? Well, I think it's more of a public-private partnership than it is actually putting a line down it and dividing things and I think that it's really a day-to-day -day thing that people make thousands of decisions on. It's not just, okay, we'll do this, the city is doing this. The city is doing what it's supposed to do, right? Collect taxes, take care of the services they're supposed to provide. And uh, corporations hire people, hopefully make profits. And if, if they're smart, they would plow a lot of those profits back into the community because I think it's, you said doing well, but I, it's really doing, doing well and doing good. Yeah, we say doing well by doing good. I think they're connected to each other. I mean, we attract more talent or high-end talent because this generation, some of them are in this room, Generation Z or Generation XYZ, I forget what they're all called. But. <laughs> <laughs> so th they're very interested in having a purposeful career, not just getting a paycheck. And so when we tell people this is our purpose or show them around or walk them around Detroit and show them some of the things we're involved with, that really does attract talent. In fact, I can tell you a story about, we have a CMO now who came from London, England, and he was the CMO of Coca-Cola at one point. That's the kind of talent we're talking about. And he came in, walked around Detroit, and just the other day in my office, he said, you know, the only reason I came here is because the energy I felt in the city, the few times I interviewed with you guys, walking around. And we took him everywhere. We took him on our stuff, but we took him to the riverfront. We took him to what Ford is doing over there. So once you have all these things going on, and even we took them down Woodward where all the entrepreneurs are opening up stores, and there's restaurants and bars, and he just felt the energy. And he said, that's one of the reasons I came here, if not the reason. So that there's an example of doing well by doing good. One feeds the other. So, so Dan, you talk about talent and attracting uh, a former Coca-Cola CMO. Um, as you started your businesses decades ago now, you had a close core, like your crew, um, some of which you grew up with. Those were all the guys that you worked with. And fast forward to today, you've got the CMO from Coca-Cola. Kofi moved here. Um, you had a relationship with him uh, in Cleveland, but he moved here, you know, from San Francisco. Yeah. You got Varun here. Talk to, you know, for, for entrepreneurs in the room who are looking to grow their business to scale, um, you got to relinquish some control. You got to identify and hire bright people to allow you to focus on the growth and the strategy. Talk about that path for you. Sure. One of the ways we describe that is what got us from here to here will not get us from here to there. And I think everybody, if you're an entrepreneur, you really have to understand that. So you can't repeat the same thing that got you from zero to 40, from 40 to 80. It's completely different. And same thing from 80 to 120. And there's different skill sets among different facets of people that you've got to bring in at certain points. It becomes very difficult because you don't want to let go of people who are there at the beginning, but generally there's spots for them somewhere in the organization, but you've got to upgrade at all times. I mean, you can look at it like a sports team. A sports team isn't going to keep people around because they're the brother of the star or the uncle of the guy that's playing or something, although there's one team that does do that. <laughs> So you, you, it's the Milwaukee Bucks, but who's talking? To okay. <laughs> so when well, you see where they are. Yep. Um, so Dan, you talk about attraction. I know attracting and maintaining and maintaining talent is important to you. You started several years ago, Detroit Venture Partners. Talk about the importance of a, a startup startup ecosystem in a city uh, in terms of attracting growth and young entrepreneurs. I mean, Dennis, it's so critical. It's, it's probably one of the top three critical things that we're doing and we've got to do more of. 
I mean, a startup community is, is everything if you want the future to be bright, because if you have a good startup community, you're funding young, growing, exciting companies. That is gonna be the magnet for retaining our graduates out of Michigan, or excuse me, out of Michigan State, Wayne State. You had it right. Yes, Michigan. <laughs> And, went, and Grand Valley State and Eastern and Western, whatever else you want to call it. But we, uh, we've got to keep our kids here. That is the number one thing we've got to do. It's just what a shame this is. Billions of dollars of tax money, state tax money, subsidizing tuition for tens of thousands of students in public universities. And we hand over this talent basically to New York, Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles, Miami. Here you go. Take all of our talent. We paid for it. Take it all. Have them work for you, have their taxes go to your cities and state, and Michigan get, you know, gets holding the bag. It's absolutely absurd. So if there's anything that we can work on, in my opinion, it's keeping the talent here. And then once you retain the talent, then we go for their talent. But first, let's retain our own. <laughs> so, you know, so. so when you talk about talent and retention, um, you know, you you want people to be able to live, work, and play. Forbes, in an article recently wrote uh, that Detroit is experiencing a renaissance with a renewed focus on urban revitalization and cultural development. Um, a part of that is the hospitality scene. I know you guys have invested significantly. We talked about the Supreme, Hiroki Sun, all at the campers, is fabulous. For those that may be in the audience that are hospitality entrepreneurs looking for a next concept, is there something specifically that you think is missing in the downtown ecosystem? I can't think of anything specific, but I do know that, as you all hear about, there's a new restaurant opening every other week downtown. And I think that, that that's gonna keep going on because we're probably still short if you look at other cities based on our population as to the amount of establishments that are gonna be needed as the city grows. But those are huge opportunities for young entrepreneurs or old entrepreneurs or, me, or medium age entrepreneurs. <laughs> so, I mean, we need all the, all the nightlife we can get. That's another magnet for young people. Just ask yourself, they're our customers. Look at the 22 year old kid as our customer. And it doesn't matter where they came from, it doesn't matter what socioeconomic area they came from, whether they're white, black, or purple, or male or female. We need, we need the young, smart, 21, 22 year olds to stay in the state. And having bars and restaurants and hospitality <laughs> is one of their boxes they look to check when they decide what city they're gonna live in. And Detroit's hot right now. You can just feel it walking around. The energy is higher than it's ever been. You don't even have to sell Detroit anymore because Detroit just sells itself when you walk them around. I wanna to talk to people on the phone about Detroit if they wanna hear. I said, no, you gotta come here and put your feet on the ground because I'm not gonna be able to give you the, what, the flavor of what it really is until you get here. So. so let's switch and talk about uh, the economy and policy for a little bit. I mean, the theme uh, of the conference is bridging the divide. As, as you're aware, um, there's so much conflict, um, not even conflict abroad, conflict domestically, conflict amongst ourselves, conflict between different parties. Um, but that is not gonna allow us, that conflict, if it persists, is not gonna allow us to put our best foot forward. The governor's commission on population um, reported, I think, that which most of us already know, that growth is stagnation. Um, we're losing uh, population still, the state of Michigan. Detroit, uh, under the mayor's leadership, had uh, a modest increase for the first time, I think, since 1957. And that's in large part to the work that you're doing. And I'll give you some more stats on the population. So if you haven't read this, for the 20 year period between 2000 and 2020, Michigan grew their population 1% total. The nation on average is 18%. That's another thing that's gotta, we gotta really work. We gotta bring people here. And I think starting with the retaining our own kids is the, is the first place, but there's other places as well. So from a policy perspective, we got a room full of policymakers and policy influencers here. What needs to happen from a policy perspective to, to allow that to hasten and, and catch up since we're so behind? Well, I think the, the big three things that we have to look at are, and again, I'm going back just to the young people. So we've done all kinds of surveys on what they want and why would they move to one city versus another city? I mean, affordable housing is key. 
And it's not, that's just not for young folks, that's for everybody. I mean, we need to have affordable housing. We need to have, you've mentioned it a few times, we need to have a vibrant, dense, populated urban area where, the, where there's action and where they can have fun and do their thing, whatever they do at night. I'm not gonna comment on what they do, but at least a lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of options, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm and not gonna. And the, the third one is transportation, I think. All of them want transportation. What specifically, what kind of transportation? All transportation, I mean, I think we need transportation to and from the suburbs, to and from the airport, to and from Ann Arbor, maybe to and from Chicago eventually. We, we've gotta have transportation everywhere, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people's opinion, not just my opinion. I mean, if you look at any big city or any big metropolitan area, who doesn't have some kind of regional transportation efforts going on or completed efforts? I mean, we're one of the few, if the only one that doesn't, which is another reason we have to think bigger. But this takes multiple facets or multiple groups in multiple cities, not cities, but multiple leaders from the private foundations to the city to the business community, to the community groups. Everybody's got to swim together here. We've got to paddle together, otherwise we're never going to make it happen. The federal government needs to be shown that we can get our act together and, and create the funding for transportation that, I don't know how technically it works, but that they match or that they put in. And they do put in big dollars to cities that can get it going themselves, or regions, or states. You mentioned um, a little while ago the federal government, and I'm not asking you to pull out a crystal ball, but from your perspective, where do in, uh, interest rates need to move uh, so that um, the mortgage business, uh, which is you know, the fuel that, um, the fuel that fuels the engine for you in particular, gets back into a groove? Well, our mortgage business, we have a big servicing business, so interest rates going up or down can be good or bad for us, depending on what side of the fence we're on that day. So, but I think interest rates are too high in this country in general, not just for mortgage rates, but for personal loans, for car loans. And I think that they will come down over the next year or two. I don't know how far they come down. I wouldn't predict that. It's like predicting gas prices. Do you think, do you, think you know, coming out of most recent economic crises, um, it's been reported that younger, the younger generation, younger than me as well, they don't place the same value on home ownership. Everyone would say that homes were your greatest asset for, for decades, people would say that. Is home ownership, in your opinion, still the American dream? Absolutely, 94% of Generation XYZ says they wanna, they wanna be a homeowner and believe that that's gonna be a significant part of their wealth creation going forward. And that's just, you know, that's the one that, that's the generation everybody says doesn't wanna buy a house or live in a, I think they're a little bit late to the game, but you gotta give them a break. They went through this whole COVID business. How is it, they went through a whole housing crisis here. They've seen it all. So they're a little bit less apt to pull the trigger, but I think they'll continue to pull the trigger. I mean, once you form a family, you have no, ch you have no choice. You gotta somehow get a living situation. You gotta buy a house, or rent a house. So future of office, um, it, I don't know the exact number, 110, 115 properties in greater downtown Detroit, uh, millions of square feet of office, and amidst um, everyone doubting uh, what the future of office is, uh, you're building an immaculate skyscraper to include office yep. in the center of downtown. So obviously you're bullish. Um, what are your thoughts on, on office? Yeah, I think that most companies are getting people back to the office, maybe not five days a week. I mean, we, we've got people back three days a week and then more than that in some areas, in some areas four days a week. It just depends on how the teams want to operate themselves. I don't think it's the most ideal thing to operate your business on Zoom. I mean, we, we have four kids now. My wife wanted to do a Zoom call with our four kids because they're all over the country and I, I started arguing with her. <laughs> I'm not gonna do a Zoom call with our kids. You gotta draw the line somewhere. <laughs> so, I just think, you know, you gotta, you gotta have people in the office, you gotta have them in person. I think that there'll always be some component of people, especially if you wanna hire people who just flat out refuse to move to Detroit or come to wherever our office is. So there's always a handful of people you wanna maybe allow to work out of their homes, but I don't think you should make it a, a practice, a long-term practice, that's my view. And overall, I think that 
the office market, although it's not doing great right now, it'll come, it'll come back soon. So, you know, back to office and the return to office or not, uh, another question from the plane, the flight in yesterday. Um, Rocket, Quicken Loans, now Rocket, has been known as one of the best places to work in the United States year after year. You published for a while, um, I think quarterly, your isms book. And for those of you who have not actually seen the book, it's very sen uh, simple, commonsensical business approach. And it's, it's, it's for a while, what, you know, it was like the Bible of Quicken Loans. Yeah. Um, you had and have a, a tremendous culture, but how are you able to maintain that culture with working a couple days a week? Some people are working from home. I think a lot of us, myself included, where in one of our businesses where everyone's at work five days at another one, people are in Tuesdays and Thursdays and they're remote. I'm personally finding it difficult to um, instill that culture compared to how we would have done it years ago. How are you handling that? Well, I think you mentioned that culture is, is everything. You gotta have great culture. Culture is the foundation. Now you look at culture, it's like, a, it's like your garden. It's the, it's the soil, it's the water, it's the air, it's the fertilizer and then you grow seeds inside that garden, and, and that, those are the people that are in your business. And I think that the leadership can't be there every second of the day in 24 hours, be next to everybody who's working in the company and pound in their, you know, their, their strategy or their thoughts or their philosophy to them. So you have to, in our case, we created these, as you mentioned, isms, which are like 20 foundational statements that become our philosophy and our belief system and that people follow to guide them in their decision making and in their, um, their prioritization and their behavior and their actions. So normally those, those books are 1999 plus shipping and handling, but, <laughs> but, but we will make them available to you at a big discount here. No, for, normally we give them out on the way out, but there were so many people here, I don't think we have as many <laughs> left in the office. So. so Dan, let's talk about sports for a second. Um, you know, I think that we're all aware um, you know, for instance, you know, the mayor, he goes out and gets a huge manufacturing facility to come into Detroit. Thousands of jobs come, but it's not just those jobs. You know, suppliers then are required to be close to the plant, so suppliers develop, and then, you know, next thing you know, there's a restaurant across the street, there's other service businesses to pop up. We talked about uh, the likelihood that that happens as a result of the Henry Ford expansion. Sports. I mean, I, I can speak to you personally, um, when the Lions are rocking, I mean, we see the numbers at Central. People are coming in with jerseys, they're coming in for Sunday brunch. If the season's longer because they're in the playoffs, uh, they're coming in uh, more weekends. Talk about the importance of sports to a city. Well, I think it's critical. I, I don't think, you, what other thing but sports is gonna get 750,000 people to come to a city to stand on the coal for 15 hours and watch five seconds of their team, their team's name being called off. I mean, I'm very happy it happens, but I still can't understand it. <laughs> Let's see, ESPN for five seconds at home or five seconds after I stood outside in the cold for 12 hours to watch my team name being called off. But hey, it's a great thing for us, right? And what a great thing that was for the city, not just for the 750,000 people that came that are going to go back and tell everybody how great Detroit is, but for the 50 million people that watch Detroit on television. And, and that's a tribute, a lot of people worked on that. The city worked very hard on that. The business community worked very hard on that. The county and state were involved to some degree, so that's another example of a big thing, a big bet, and everybody coming together to do it. You, can name, you can't name one big project going on in Detroit right now, or Michigan for that matter, that doesn't have a lot of different groups and a lot of different sects involved in making it happen. So if we've learned, I know Detroit going back, I mean, it was the union versus management, it was suburbs versus the city, there was racial issues. I mean, everybody's fighting with everybody for decades, but I think in the last 10, 15 years or so, that's been way better. You can tell from just this conference here, people talking to each other, talking about ideas to get things done, and I think that has to be a mainstay of our culture. That's an example of culture, in my opinion. I want to talk about uh, legacy in a second, but you know it, it's interesting. We have, for Michigan, very pivotal times over the next three years. We got, obviously have a presidential election this year. We've got a mayoral election next year, and then we've got a gubernatorial election the year after that. 
agnostic to individual or party, what policies need to change for us to move our Detroit agenda forward? Well, as far as Michigan goes, I'll, I'll talk on Michigan because I think it's more than Detroit. I think that we need both sides of the aisle in the state legislature to get together and, and work on economic packages that are long-term. We, we gotta stop doing the short-term, year-to-year stuff. That doesn't work. We have to make long-term investments. As I said before, look at all the investments that have been made. I don't think that Ford Motor Company is doing that whole deal with the train station for the next year or two. They're doing it for the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not doing the Hudson's project because we expect to make profit on it next year. In fact, it'll be, a, it'll be lucky if there's a profit in 30 years. So we're, um, we're committed to the long term, and I think that goes for transportation. I think that goes for anything that we do. So education is the same way. Legacy a little bit. Um, obviously, I didn't have an opportunity to meet your father. I obviously knew uh, Nick very well. It's a regular at the restaurant. Everybody loved him. You have two new hospitality concepts downtown, um, Gillies and Saxies, that are equally as important legacy as they are contributors to the hospitality ecosystem. Talk to us about the importance of sure. those two concepts to you personally. Well, these are very important personal projects for me. So my son's nickname to his friend was Gilly. And he had this dream of having this big sports bar in downtown Detroit about people where he wanted people just to gather and have fun. And he was very, very involved. Up until the very end, he he was on his phone dictating to people the way he wanted tile and and the ceiling and what kind of materials he wanted in this this, uh, restaurant or sports bar. I encourage you all to go there because it's really a sweet place, very nice. And they've got great, it's called Bam Bam Broccoli, you gotta check it out. (laughs) I mean the broccoli, you know, many, and he hated broccoli, he wouldn't wouldn't eat anything green, but this, I don't know what they do to it, but it's that and the Smash Burger, those are my two recommendations. I mean, Saxe's was the name of my dad's bar that he had in Detroit for 30 or 40 years, which is at Seven Mile in Woodward. That's my neighborhood. You live there? Right now. Do you? Mm -hmm. Palmer Park, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Nice area, man. Yeah, you have to come over. I will. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, a couple questions from the the plane. We've got a few minutes left. You know, uh, Rachel Decker, who's a good friend of ours, who's very passionately involved in philanthropy, you know, she was wondering, you know, the investments that you're making now, under Laura's leadership and the rest of your philanthropic team are pertinent to the needs today. But when you look at neighborhoods, home ownership, economic development, do you think those will forever be uh, the, the focuses of the foundation or will they pivot with the needs of the city of Detroit? That was a long question, man, a long question. All right, let me ask you a shorter. Okay, good. Do you think that what you're doing now um, with the foundation will be what you're doing in 10 years from now. I'm sure it'll evolve like everything else, but I'll just tell you this, I'm giving it all away and we're gonna give most of it to Detroit area here. I mean, I can't take it with me. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, your wealth is gonna end up at the government and foundations or you're gonna kill your kids with too much wealth. So I'm not gonna do the latter, I don't want, Nothing personal about government people here, but I'd rather not put it in the government's hand. I'd rather put it in foundations' hands. They're going to do great stuff long term. We're about long term, as I mentioned before. I mean, Laura Grandman's here. She's like 32 years old, and she runs this foundation. Been with us for 12 years. That's an example of somebody that came to Detroit when she was 21 or 22, when we really didn't have the kind of city we have now, but it took a lot of talking into to get her here from Georgetown, right? Okay, good. She probably went to Michigan, too. What's that? You heard me. She did not. <laughs> she did not go to Michigan. So she, she uh, visited Ann Arbor once. Uh, I heard that. Yep. So l- let me ask you this: as as we close, so you, you're, you and your family and all of your organizations, handprints, footprints are all over this city. Um, but when you and Jennifer, you know, write your story at the end of the day what will be the highlight? I think the highlight will be just overall, how, how many people could we impact in a positive way? And how could we lead others to do the same thing? So that, that would probably be, at the end of the day, the number one thing that would be the most 
That's and right. you've got uh, several hundred um, Detroit boosters, Michigan boosters, policymakers in this room. Uh, so as we walk off the stage, what, what would you ask for them to do to help move Detroit forward, these people in this room? Well, I would say, you know, think big, but don't worry about that every project's gotta be huge. Just think big because sometimes for the person who's gonna open up a restaurant, they're just thinking big for them. But we do get it, we have to think big. We gotta, we gotta paddle together, as I said earlier. We, we all gotta paddle together and be together and meet more often and brainstorm together and, and have a long-term plan, like I said earlier. And we gotta have a consolidated approach too. We, we should look at everything. When we came to Detroit, one of the things we said, we're gonna have a big bang approach. We're not gonna focus on residential first, then entertainment, then office, or then um, industrial, which we don't do, but we're saying let's just have a big bang approach and build it all at once if we can make it happen because everything feeds each other. So I think that that's the way we gotta think. You're not gonna fix everything in one day, but we can have an approach. I hear there's something good going on in the legislature right now that they're talking about putting something together in three or four areas. It's not an either or decision. I think a lot of times because of that division in the aisle that people think it's gotta be for this and the other aisles thinks it's gotta be for this other side of the aisle. I think we gotta do it all together and look at each other and say, how can we make it all happen together? And whether it means compromise or whether it means brainstorming and just adding it all together. I know some, that's easy to say because you gotta pay for it all, but you gotta believe your investments are gonna be paid for in the long term too. Dan, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan thank Gilbert. You. Thank you. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at DTEFoundation.com. We help organizations find their voices through what they do and who they impact. We are VVKPR and Creative, a Detroit agency telling the stories of critical issues affecting the big picture and the small moments. Stories at Skyline Heights and on the ground influence. We lead with relationships first, solutions always, and with diversity as our compass. VVKPR and Creative.